Hey everyone, this is Will from China, and welcome to this brand new and exciting episode of The Missing Piece. In the year of 2020, COVID-19, or even the pandemic, hit the world pretty hard. On one hand, it was rather ridiculous to hear some of the countries claim that pandemic or COVID-19 was rather a foolish idea. And、meanwhile, people were dying on the streets and and also in the hospital. On the other hand, I'm thankful towards the COVID nineteen because it helped the world to rethink about the word humanity and compassion. Nepal, it's one of the smallest country in Asia. It was hard to imagine how many people died in this small country. Because of COVID nineteen, even the president from Nepal were begging the bigger countries to help. For example, America and many countries in the European continent as well. However, in the midst of the chaos, it was rather difficult to take care of others and the domestic patients at the same time. However, two countries stood out: Russia. And China. In this episode, I invited what he called the Prince of Nepal to join our show, and he shared with me two points. Number one, why in the midst of the pandemic, China was willing to help this small country, and how effective was it? And second, what about his relationship as the Prince of Nepal with China? He came to China. He came to one of the most beautiful cities in China. Immediately, he fell in love, and after the study and after the trip, this person did something extraordinary about the two countries and cultivate the relationship in a more meaningful way. Check it out. Yeah, thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be on your show. Where are you based right now, and how would you describe your current location, Nepal? Okay, I am in my hometown, and the name of the city is Bhaktapur. Bhaktapur means like Kathmandu is the Nepal. Kathmandu have three cities: Bhaktapur, Lalitpur, and Kathmandu.、Mm. So, Bhaktapur, the meaning itself means the land of devotees. And it's full of temples, and there are more temples than homes in my hometown. So I am basically, I would say, I can, I am in the land of devotees or land of devotion. Well, Bison, I realize that because again, as I mentioned in the intro, we didn't get a chance, or we haven't really heard a lot about. Uh, um, Nepal for a while, and especially regarding um the current situation, because once in a while we get a chance to say, or we get a chance to understand, say, oh, there are a lot more international travelers to this country. But meanwhile, people are greatly concerned about the culture and also about the social stability in Nepal. So, from your perspective as a native speaker, how would you describe this social stability and also the unique culture from your country? Okay, so Nepal is a small Himalayan country, though it is small, but it's diverse. You know,、mm. it's small, but we have more than one hundred ethnic groups and. One hundred languages. So this is also one speciality about Nepal, and about the social stability. Though we come from different ethnic groups, we live in peace and harmony. So people from all religion, caste, and ethnic groups, and about the political stability also. Like before ten years, there was political instability. There was something kind of a civil war in the country, but as of now. It, Country is politically stable as well. Well, Bison, I realize based on your intro that you seem to have a special relationship with China, and also you are awarded or given the title Prince of Nepal, and also you participated for this special ceremony commemorate the seventieth、uh, founding of、um, the Chinese Communist Party. Can you share with us a little bit what was your special relationship? 
between you and China. And of course, this is a very special and it's a great honor for you and also for the country. Can you share with us a little bit? Okay, my bonding with China started from Confucius Institute at Kathmandu University. I am a graduate of Kathmandu University in Nepal. So during my undergrad days, like there was a Confucius Institute and all the teachers in that institute were Chinese, you know, and they were flourishing Chinese culture and language through the Confucius Institute. And I joined the Confucius Institute just for fun, you know, there mm. was nothing. There was a Confucius Institute and I just thought maybe it's interesting. Let's join this institute and let's learn some Chinese. But it was just for fun. Then that was the bonding point for me. Then I came into contact with Chinese language and culture and I grew more interested in it. And then Confucius Institute gave me a scholarship to study Chinese in China for one semester. So the first time I went to China, it was the city of Hangzhou. Mm. And I fell in love with Hangzhou. In China, they say, Sang Yau Tian Tan, Xia Yau Su Han. <laughs> Above lies heaven, below there is Hangzhou and Su Cao. And I, I really believe in it. I was completely in love with Hangzhou when I was astonished. Not just by the city, also by the hospitality I received there, you know, the people and everything. I saw like great, great patriotism in the hearts of people, like as, as like as a unified people. Mm. And then I pursued my master's degree and my PhD degree. And I also organized because I come from a family. I have an art gallery here. I would say we have our family have a, an art gallery in Nepal. So I also organized many exhibitions in Beijing, like Belt and Road Initiative Nepal Thangka exhibition three times in Beijing. So I worked as a cultural bridge between Nepal and China. And also I want to be uh, not just a cultural bridge, but also scientific bridge because I am a scientist by profession. So I want to be both cultural and scientific bridge between China and Nepal in the near future as well. This is a very interesting topic. And also, this is a very critical matter. Before we get to um, Busan, when you mentioned One Belt, One Road initiative. But I do want to ask you a question is, when you were living in Hangzhou, and by the way, that was a beautiful description of the city. And meanwhile, I want to ask you is, when you were living in Hangzhou, did you find any similar cultural resemblance between Nepal and China? Because again, people always say, well, you know, um, for a lot more international travelers, they will say when we come to Asia, most of the uh, countries in Asia, they share the similarities in culture, in languages, or etc. But I think for people who have never been to Nepal and they don't know anything about it, but from, from your perspective, do you see any similar uh, um, uh, examples or similar similarities between China and Nepal and also in what way? Okay, but first I would like to say I was completely influenced by my teachers and colleagues. You know, I would like to say not just China and Nepal. When you go, like I have been all around the world, but normal people, you know, normal people are same everywhere in the world. Mm. We have nothing to do much with politics or blah, 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 things, normal people, and also like people like teachers, professors, you know, middle class people are same everywhere in the world. And in terms of Nepal and China, you know, I think our ancient knowledge and Buddhism and this kind of things, this binds us together. Uh, when I was in Hangzhou, I saw a lot of Buddhist stupas. There is one big park known as Lingin Sea all Buddhism. So I was really influenced and found myself at home. Mm. Well, Busan, let's get to the next question about what you mentioned before, the One Belt, One Road initiative. Of course, this is one of the profound projects, not only that it, um, impacts domestically, but also internationally. And we know there are so many countries, not only in Asia, but also outside Asia are also actively participating on this project. But from your perspective, how do you think the One Belt, One Road initiative actually um, or um, actively 
uh, connect China and Nepal together? And as a scientist, can you give us a little bit more insights? Okay, I think uh, Belt and Road Initiative is a project that could drastically change the future of developing countries. You know, I am not talking about developed countries like developing or underdeveloped countries like Nepal or even Myanmar or Thailand, you know, these countries which are around China. It could be a game changer for their future. Because for us, from a Nepalese perspective, we didn't have a railway connection in Nepal yet. So we are a landlocked country and we are dependent upon India for all our imports and everything, you know. Mm. So if we join Belt and, Zoo, Belt and Road Initiative and there is a link between Kathmandu and Beijing or through Lhasa, then it's not just we are connected to China, we are connected to all the places which are linked by Belt and Road Initiative to Europe, to Middle East or to other Asian countries in the other part. So it will give us an opportunity, you know, to connect to the world. So as also the Chinese Communist Party or the Chinese government says like Belt and Road Initiative is will convert like now we say Nepal is a landlocked country. Mm. So after the Belt and Road Initiative, we will become land linked country. Mm. Well, and so this is true for most most of the countries like in the world for especially for underdeveloped countries. Mm. Well, Bison, again, um, if I mention something we called WeChat, and I'm sure you're very much familiar with it because WeChat is now today just used by Chinese users but also used by international users in again outside China or outside Nepal. And I realized that every time you always share a lot more interesting content, not only images, but also your journeys in China and also your memories um, of study or learning in China. Can you, can you share with us how critical or how significant is for people to understand a Nepali scientist spent good amount of time in China and right now being the bridge between these two countries. How significant is that for you personally? Personally, for me, like, I would say, like, China has given me a lot of opportunities. Like, I, I always say during my interviews or everything, from Beijing to the world. Mm. I was in Beijing and I got an opportunity to go around the world and introduce the culture of Nepal but also China, you know, when I go abroad, everywhere, I say, I am from Nepal, I come from Nepal, I was born in Nepal, but I am a man from Beijing. Mm. <laughs> so I introduced myself as a man from Beijing and introduced the Chinese culture as well. And, you know, here, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is not just about business or transit, it's like people to people exchange, you know, it's more about, I have seen the exchanges from lowest level to the highest level, you know, from normal workers to politicians and also scientific exchanges are very important. Mm. And also now after this Corona pandemic, Belt and Road Initiative could play a very, very vital role in distributing the vaccines and help countries battle this pandemic. Here I would like to say like before like two months, the situation was worse in Nepal, you know. Mm. We didn't have much medical infrastructures to fight. And even the Nepalese president, she wrote to a lot of countries, presidents or head of states to India, England, USA, Russia and China. The only one that was ready to help and help immediately actually was China. You know, the mm. president, she, as soon as he received the call from our president, he, make, he made an announcement of like uh, of uh, like one billion, one million doses of coronavirus vaccine has helped and now nepal is going to buy 4 million doses mm. so this is also a, a strategy or a very important point for belt and road initiative just as what busan shared with me during the interview it's not really about fighting against the pandemic together it was a good opportunity to connect the two countries 
together for the greater future. I really appreciate the time from Busan. He was willing to join my show and share with me his passionate and his enthusiastic stories about the relationship between him and China. Again, Nepal today continues as one of the vibrant and prosperous countries in Asia. And if you have never been to Nepal, I strongly encourage you to visit this country and you are not going to be disappointed. Again, everyone, this is Will from China. Thank you for watching. Please continue to click on the button below to follow our show. And also, do me a favor. If you have ever been to Nepal, please feel free to leave your comments and questions. I love to hear more experiences from you. And also, if you have any ideas or new ideas to contribute to the missing piece, please feel free to connect with us. And we're looking forward to seeing you next time. Enjoy your weekend.